Hello, this is Matt Ingram with a brief mini lecture on the material from the first week of class. In this first week, we've covered a lot of introductory material on concepts, variables, and explanatory propositions, and this mini lecture offers a brief summary of that content. In very broad terms, we could simplify the overarching goal of studying methods, looking to the title of this course of of studying tools for policy analysis as seeking to answer a certain kind of question, right? That is the goal of this course or the goal of studying methods is to answer questions like how confident can we be in what we know? How do we know what we know? For instance, if, we, if we're evaluating a particular policy, whether it's about education or gun control or abortion rights, uh, we might want to ask or we might want to know whether that particular policy is effective. So how do we know whether it's effective and how confident can we, can we be in the conclusions that we draw about whether a particular policy is effective? We can extend these tools and this kind of knowledge or these techniques to the study of essentially any outcome of interest, whether you're interested in war and conflict or climate change or other, other, other forms of environmental change. Essentially choose your policy of choice, institution of choice, behavior of choice, outcome of choice. If you're interested in explaining variation in that outcome, why it occurs in one place and not in another, why it occurs at one time and not in another, then you're interested in this, these kinds of explanatory propositions about the world, right? And the more we can develop sound tools uh, or methods for studying these kinds of outcomes, and the more confident we can be in the conclusions that we draw uh, about those outcomes of interest. We can think of methods in a way as rules of the road or a set of rules that allow us to determine how confident we can be about what we know about some outcome of interest in the world. As we've already covered thus far this week, uh, we've examined the sets of rules about how to build uh, good or strong concepts. Uh, we've looked at rules for turning concepts into variables, that is measuring the concepts that we've already built. Then we've also examined some rules about how we might pair concepts together or string concepts together to form propositions about the world, whether they are descriptive propositions, normative propositions, or explanatory propositions. And again, we're concerned more with descriptive propositions and explanatory propositions, but I'll return to this later. And then we've also begun to to identify some rules about how we might test causal or explanatory propositions about the world. We want to practice these rules of the road so that beco they become what others have called uh, good habits of mind or they become ingrained best practices for developing knowledge about the world if we can internalize then ways of thinking about how to build good concepts, how to turn good concepts into good variables, how to string good concepts together to make good propositions, and then how to test those good propositions to develop good explanations, uh, good knowledge, valid knowledge, strong knowledge about the world, then we are doing a good job of thinking about the way we think. In chapter one, we covered some of these rules of the road for concept formation. Uh, one of the highlights from that chapter uh, is Pollock's discussion of conceptual definitions and operational definitions. There's a heavy emphasis in Pollock on developing concepts that are not only good in and of themselves, right, that they, they make sense as uh, ideal or, or as uh, descriptions of an idea or definitions of an idea, but that they also make a transition to variables well, right? That a, in, in many ways Pollock's argument is that a good 
concept is one that can be measured well. Um, and he offers us uh, a few strategies for building sound or good concepts. Pollock's emphasis is on something he calls the polar opposites approach. Uh, and then we uh, covered a, a different approach in an article by Giovanni Sartori, which he uh, calls a mid-max approach in his discussion of the ladder of abstraction, of how you can build concepts that are either more abstract because they have fewer attributes or properties, or they are more concrete, or less abstract, if they have uh, a higher number of properties, more properties. In essence, as a, as a concept becomes more clearly defined, there are fewer real examples of that concept out in the world. It becomes much more concrete and uh, delimited. Towards the end of chapter one and then throughout chapter two, the discussion shifted to measurement. That is to the process of turning concepts into variables, turning the uh, definition of an idea into an operational measure of that idea. And uh, Pollock highlights two criteria for good uh, measures, and those are reliability and validity. Building on the discussion of concepts and measurement of those concepts, Pollock also discusses a, a variety of propositions that we could make about the world. And he does this in, in, the, in the introduction, but then develops that more fully in chapter 3. Uh, essentially, we could we could talk about four main types of propositions that we could make about the world. Uh, descriptive proposition, as Pollock notes, is is uh, addresses what kind of questions, right? Sort of what is the world like? So we we might make a description of a particular policy across the United States and say something like capital punishment exists in many states. Uh, we're not saying that anything causes or is a consequence of capital punishment. We're simply making a description of a particular policy in the United States. A normative prop proposition um, addresses whether that particular outcome of interest, in this case a particular policy, ought to or should uh, exist as it does. Right. So the, the normative version of the descriptive proposition that we've um, that we're using as an example would be that capital punishment should or ought to exist in, in many states. An explanatory proposition, by contrast, um, would look something like this, right? Like capital punishment uh, deters violent crime, right? That there's a, there's a cause and effect relationship addressed in the explanatory proposition concept A, capital punishment, causes uh, variation in concept B, right, violence or criminality or violent crime. And then there might be a predictive variation on the explanatory proposition. Presumably if we are able to explain something from the past or the present, then we can use that explanatory knowledge to anticipate or predict what might happen in the future with some level of confidence. So if the explanatory proposition that we've just addressed is true, namely that capital punishment deters violent crime, then presumably the predictive variation of that proposition would be if a state adopts capital punishment or other forms of severe penalties, then that state will have lower rates of violent crime. Right? So if, if a state adopts capital punishment in the future, then uh, rates of violent crime after that will be lower. Pollock notes these different types of propositions or arguments or claims that we can make about the world. Uh, but one thing uh, I'd like the class to consider or think about, and we can certainly open this up for discussion, is in, in what order do these types of propositions uh, take place? And I would suggest to you that we can have more confidence in normative and predictive statements if we first establish solid descriptive and explanatory statements about the world. So we might 
be more confident in the capital punish in the normative statement capital punishment should exist if we have first done some research some explanatory research that tests the explanatory proposition about whether capital punishment actually in fact deters violent crime you know, we might have our own personal opinions about capital punishment or we might have values that lead us to believe one thing or another normatively about capital punishment but empirically if capital punishment deters violent crime then you might be on more confident footing to make the normative statement that capital punishment should exist. Conversely, if capital punishment does not deter violent crime, and presumably that's the end goal, is reducing violent crime, if capital punishment does not deter violent crime, then you would not be in a good position to make the normative statement that capital punishment should exist for the purposes of deterring violent crime. So if we can only make um, normative and predictive claims about the world, if we have first made sound, descriptive, and explanatory propositions about the world, then we want to pay particular attention to those descriptive and explanatory propositions to, and to testing those explanatory propositions. And that's the, the focus, really, of um, chapters 2 and chapter 3, and really of the rest of the course. Descriptive propositions, again, return to concept formation and measurement. Essentially, a good concept and a good measure of that concept tell us something descriptive about an outcome of interest or a phenomenon of interest. So they describe the world to us. Also, as discussed in Chapter 2, measures of central tendency and dispersion are two ways of summarizing or of describing in a very summary, quick way an outcome of interest. Essentially, with these kinds of descriptions, we are drawing a conclusion about the way the world is. Right? We're not trying to explain anything or make any normative statement or predictive statement about the world. We're just trying to make an inference, that is, draw a conclusion about the way the world is. Explanatory propositions are the focus of chapter 3. Here Pollock pays uh, special attention to developing hypotheses, there offers us a template for developing hypotheses, and then uh, builds on this discussion of hypotheses to talk more fully about explanatory propositions generally and how we might go about uh, testing explanatory propositions, testing hypotheses, um, at least with some initial tools. So in very short form, Pollock might uh, define a hypothesis as a causal argument about some outcome of interest, that is an explanation, that is both plausible and testable. So it's plausible in that it might make sense to us, given what else we know about the world, but it's also testable in that we can go out into the world and either falsify this causal argument or support it. And causal arguments essentially consist of connecting two concepts and their measures. Right? We might have one cause, one concept, a cause, that is related to another concept, an effect. So in our earlier example of capital punishment and violent crime, we might have one concept, capital punishment. <coughs> Excuse me. That is a cause and and the effect is violent crime and then variation on whether capital punishment exists or does not exist or maybe even how it's implemented has a causal relationship with rates of violent crime. We use in social science and in methodology different terms for causes. Some people refer to them as independent variables or causal factors. They are often uh, shorthanded with the symbol X. And then effects also go by other names. The most common are, uh, the, the most common other names for an effect is a dependent variable or a response variable. <coughs> 
and, this sh and effects are usually shorthanded with the symbol y. So again, we might think of the simple equation x causes y as the shorthand for the causal argument that some cause x um, explains some effect y. In chapter 3 and at the start of chapter 4, Pollock turns our attention to testing these causal explanation that explanations that we've developed. And one of the basic ways of testing caus causal arguments is to make comparisons. That is, we, we want to compare variation in x to variation in y. How do different values of our causal factor how are those different values in our causal vector related to different values in our effect or response or dependent variable? And the level of measurement of these variables, both x and y, guides our selection of techniques for doing this, for making these comparisons. Summarizing the material thus far, then, we have uh, very durable, long-lasting, long-standing rules in the social sciences for building concepts, turning those concepts into variables, that is, measuring those concepts, stringing concepts together to make descriptive and explanatory propositions about the world, and then testing those causal or explanatory propositions by making comparisons, and then later, as discussed in Chapter 4, by controlling for alternative explanations while making comparisons. Again, these materials are very closely related. Right? The process of building a good concept naturally leads or transitions into the process of measuring that concept building good concepts and measures naturally leads into stringing those concepts together to make arguments about the world. And we are most interested in descriptive and causal arguments about the world. And the level of measurement for the concepts in our propositions guides our selection of techniques for testing causal arguments, for making comparisons and controlled comparisons about the world. These are the basic building blocks for the rest of the material in this course. The tests of causal arguments get more elaborate, but the core logic remains the same.